I would like to first start off by saying how truly humble we are uh, to receive your support, your friendship, uh, your philanthropy, uh, you being our cheerleaders in this entire community. You have no idea how difficult the funding environment is in the country to do research. And if you really have to rely on government funding to do research, by the time you get the research dollars in your hand, that idea is outdated. It's already three or four years. And I can say that because I have been the recipient of hope. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in Texas before I came here. And within one or two years of my fellowship, a very generous uh, institution gave me a $2 million endowed chair. And you know, the way endowed chairs work, the endowed chair is a permanent legacy. Uh, but I get the investment out of the endowed chair. And the investment is 5%, which is guaranteed. So I got about $100,000 to work with in that time. And that $100,000 was transformational for someone like me uh, about six or seven years back. Because with that, I could easily do a research project that I desperately wanted to do about kidney cancer. It's a very practical problem. A lot of men and women with kidney cancer uh, in two or three decades back, if someone had a kidney tumor, whether it was a one centimeter tumor or a 15 centimeter tumor, all you did was remove that entire kidney. But things change that people realize that kidneys are very important organs. And if you can save most of a kidney, why do you have to remove the entire kidney? So we then went from doing that to just taking the tumor out and saving the rest of the kidney. However, to do that, uh, there are certain restrictions and barriers that prohibited a lot of surgeons from, from doing that, from saving kidneys. And I wanted to answer that question about what can I do to overcome or remove some of those barriers. And with that $100,000, I started a clinical trial and finished the trial in three or four years. And sure enough, uh, in five years, I found an answer. There was never ever an uh, answer in the history of medicine uh, that removed a major barrier in terms of saving kidneys. So that's what that $100,000 did. The other thing that that $100,000 did was allow me to hire a part-time research nurse. And that's when I first started the prospective randomized clinical trial that head-to-head -head compared open versus the robotic surgery for bladder cancer. I was able to do that in about 40 patients, but what the government and the National Cancer Institute wants to see is preliminary data. So I was able to generate that preliminary data and I then combined with 14 institutions and got a $3.1 million grant. And, and recently finished the first ever multi-institutional, 14 institutions, the prospective randomized trial compared in open to robotic surgery all over the country in a total of 350 patients and we finished occurring on the trial two weeks back. We finished the trial, we, had made his, we already have made history by finishing the trial. We won't know the results for two years, but that's something that was all started by the philanthropy of $2 million that was given to, to me. So, I'm, and so I have the government money with me, the $3.1 million, and I had the, the philanthropy, now I have the Polytown and now chair. And <clears throat> I can tell you, just dealing with the government agencies on a routine basis to do research is extremely time consuming. If someone gave us the freedom to work uh, with funds in a way that uh, we don't have to answer too many questions and we are allowed to do what we want to do without micromanagement, I can assure you our fight against cancer will be significantly expedited. Very, very important to know. And in that context, I would like to... In that context, I deeply appreciate the contributions of PAPCO uh, to have contributed more than $50 million over the last several years and 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 just the passion being our cheerleaders. How many of you have read the book Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell? There are a few. And this is what I call the tipping point. This whole entire group is a tipping point for our cancer center. Because no matter how well we do locally in Sylvester or in DFPP or so and so on, we, we can never, our reach is as big or as wide as your, or as broad as your reach. And it's only because of you that
said, you are the tipping point for us to be known as a local cancer center to a global cancer center. And I deeply appreciate uh, the contributions of BAPCORP, and I would like to applaud BAPCORP for that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> obviously, I'm sure you're interested a little bit in what I do, who I am, and where I come from. <clears throat> so, I'm going to pretend a little bit like I'm my mother, and say a few, <laughs> and say a few good things about myself. <laughs> and if I go too overboard, you can be my wife and break me down. <laughs> so, so uh, I did my entire medical education in India. I came here uh, on a Rotary International Scholarship. I was a fully trained urologist, a board certified fully trained urologist and a general surgeon who could have been to practice the next day. The reason I came here was uh, I really, really wanted, there's a huge discordance between what I was reading in textbooks and answering questions in exam versus what I was doing in India. And I never wanted to be someone who could be, who someone could say, that, oh, he's good for an Indian standard or he's good by Asian standard. I just wanted to be the best in the world. And that's why I came to the United States. Um, thank you. Uh, so I came to Vanderbilt, did a couple of years of research, I went to Memorial Sloan, uh, did an entire residency for five years, I repeated my training, went to Sloan Gateway Cancer Center, uh, went to San Antonio, uh, ran a robotic program there. Uh, personally, I've done more than 3,000 robotic surgeries for kidney, prostate, and bladder cancer. And I would say that you'll find maybe, maybe one or two people in the entire world who have this portfolio. There are folks who have done more surgeries than I have, but they're only in one particular organ. Uh, uh, there are folks who do open surgery. But there are very few who do, who have done this breadth of work uh, with this quantity. So I have done that. Uh, I have an R01 grant, the $3.1 million grant that I just talked about. Uh, I also did a master's in healthcare administration so that I could be competitive to get this position in Miami. Um, after all this, I, uh, I was in San Antonio. I started uh, three robotic surgery programs in San Antonio. I started one robotic surgery program in South Texas, right at the border of Mexico and the uh, United States. Uh, started the robotic surgery program in Mumbai. Uh, there was a national search for the chair of urology at the University of Miami. Uh, two, uh, two, three years back, there were 32 people who applied for this position. Uh, I was very humbled and honored to be selected amongst them. That led me to come here to Miami. Uh, and very recently, I also received the highest honor that the American Urology Association can give to anyone who's in active urology for the Cold Cystoscope Award. This was started in 1977, and it's only given to one person of uh, 20 or 30,000 year olds in the United States. Now the recipient of that last year. I'll, I'll, I'll stop at this. I think this is enough. Uh, so, so I do, I, so basically, when you look at any academic, I know that all of you at some point, uh, either directly or indirectly, will come in contact with an academic physician. And there are three main pillars of academic uh, medicine. One is clinical service, uh, one is research, and one is education. And you can find uh, folks who can excel in one. If they excel in two, that's really, really rare. It's almost impossible to find people who can excel in all three. Uh, I by no means am saying that I have excelled in either of them, but I'm trying my best every day to improve myself in all three areas. The main reason I was recruited, I think, uh, was that Sylvester and the University of Miami was really behind in terms of robotic surgery for urologic cancers. When I came in August of 2012, we had one functional robot. And each robot, as you know, cost about $2 million. This is 2012 August. We are in December 2014. Guess how many robots we have in our system right now? That's true, five. We have five functional robots right now. We went from one to five. And we basically used to do 10 robotic surgeries a month when I arrived in August of 2012. 
Guess how many we do every month now? Close, close to 50 to 60. Uh, 50 to 60 a month. And we had, we, we used to perform, so if you look at the entire South Florida, and you look at the major health systems in South Florida, you have uh, the Baptist Health System, you have Mount Sinai, you have Cleveland Clinic, you have the Jackson South, and then you have us, and the HCA system, the Mercy Hospital, so on and so forth. On August 2012, uh, we performed 17, one seven, 17 percent of all robotic neurologic procedures in South Florida. Today, we perform 42 percent. And, and, uh, and with all your support, I can easily see this number going up to around at least 60 to 65 percent, if not more. And I will be with you. Now, how were we able to achieve this? Uh, you know, a lot of times you have vision statements and mission statements, and you know, it's all about uh, you know writing everything, the blueprint on the paper, and so on and so forth. And you hire outside consulting agencies to do that billions of dollars or thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, I, I, have, I have our vision statement or our mission statement or our strategy, if you will, is only three. And those are the three A's, uh, the ability, availability, and affability. So as far as ability is concerned, I believe firmly that in terms of expertise in robotic and neurologic cancers, you will not find a better group of more talented, compassionate, dedicated individuals than our group. And, uh, and, and I say this with complete honesty uh, and, and, and objectivity. Uh, in terms of availability, basically we have physician liaison managers now in my department that go to all the primary care and urologic uh, neurologists and, and give our information. And, and, uh, and I have a couple of patients here who may attest, I'm not, I'm not going to take any names, that I give my cell phone to every single patient and their family members. So that they may be able to reach me any time of day and night. Because you know what? If there is a problem with my patient, I want to be the first one. To know. I just want to end by asking a question. What's the best way of predicting our future? Research, that's great. Anything else? Huh? Prevention, staying healthy, that's great, that's perfect. So I think you're right. And what, what I'm trying to convey is the best way to predict our future is to create our future.